so my name is Josh. Um, you can tell because it, uh, it says, well, it says Josh. And, and um, if you have questions, if you leave this room with more questions than when you, answer, when you entered, if you have uh, feedback, you know, I would love to have them by email or alternatively, oh, thank you, sir. My water, I love those waters. Uh, alternatively, uh, join us in the, and this is, I'm told, a thing. There's a, something called a power lounge. Yes? So join me in that if you like after this, and I'll be doing a QA for an hour. Is that right? Uh, courtesy of Pearson and so on. Uh, right, so email, Twitter. Is 2015 how many of you are on Twitter? I need, oh, oh, Chicago. Why? Where, where's the hand? That's 2015, folks. Come on. Get on the Twitter. So I'm the uh, developer advocate for, for the spring team at Pivotal, as, uh, as I just explained. I'm the Leading of contributor of bugs to many fine spring projects. How many of you know spring? Okay, good. It's a thing. It's been around. I'm the uh, lead author on going on five different books now and uh, lead uh, presenter or co-presenter on uh, three different uh, Pearson live lesson videos, the latest and greatest of which has just been released, I think, today. Okay, so that's, that's now timely and appropriate as opposed to just other times that it was completely irrelevant. Um, and I'm an open source dude, you know, I, I, I love open source, so uh, again, Twitter, email, if you have questions, don't hesitate to reach out to me, I'm here for you. I work for Pivotal, how many of you have heard of Pivotal? We have an amazing office in the bar, at least we used to last year, maybe it's bigger now, I don't know. And uh, the reason I remember where it is, is because it's right next to Intelligentsia Coffee, which is my favorite coffee in the world. So, if you like good coffee and great code, they might be hiring. Uh, we at Pivotal care about building a platform for modern applications and modern workloads. And a huge part of that, of course, is building applications that work well in the cloud, right? Uh, today's applications don't live in the same place as they used to live. So why do we build applications in the same way we used to build them? Uh, Pivotal is home to lots of great open source stuff. How many of you have heard of uh, Apache Tomcat? Okay, okay. Uh, Spring, of course. Uh, RabbitMQ? Um, it's used by some small mom and pop shops like the Huffington Post. Um, how many of you have heard of Redis, the distributed data structure server? Used by some small mom and pop shops like Twitter for, for caching and so on. Uh, cloud Foundry, open source platform as a service. It's used by, again, some very small mom and pop cloud ventures like IBM and HP uh, for their events. Uh, we're, you know, just a holistic approach to application development. One thing that we wanted to do was to build it in to help people build applications for these new environments, these new platforms, as quickly as possible. So we set our minds to, to making that experience as pleasant as possible and as quick as possible. A huge part of that is something called Spring Boot. We released Spring Boot in uh, 2013, and uh, it went GA last year. There are a lot of different ways to start with Spring Boot. Uh, but my favorite way, my absolute favorite way is, well, it's, it's this, it's, it's start.spring.io. It's a little bit of code generation. Now don't, don't freak out, okay? This is the last you can see of code generation through the entire talk. Uh, it's just a regular pro forma uh, form here. You've got the normal Maven or Gradle bits. You've got group, artifact, name, description, packaging, uh, the type of project you'd like to build, be it a, a Maven or a Gradle project, uh, a jar or a war. Now this is an important inflection point in your journey. Okay, this is very, very important that we take time and acknowledge the magnitude of the choice here. If you are, through some fluke of physics, stuck in 2001, then this is the right choice. I would choose war. But since you're not, in all likelihood, stuck in 2001, but are instead in 2015, here today with me, let's choose job. Okay? Again, if you're in 2001, choose this. If you're in today, Choose that. This goes along with my philosophy of make jaw, not water. Okay? Very, very important. We'll talk about this more and more as we go on, but uh, keep that in mind. So jaw, again, 2015, choose jaw. Uh, Java version, 1.6, 1.7, 1.8. How many of you are, by show of hands, are on 1.6? Again, you're among friends. This is just between us and the camera. It's okay, we all tried it once in college. 1.6, here we go. Okay, 1.7, how many of you are on 1.7? Okay, 
Okay, no judging. I'm just going to put this out there, but that is officially end of uh, updates, you know, end of life. It's just security updates, if that, from here on down. Just leaving that there. Take it for what you will. 1.8, how many of you are using the awesome sauce 1.8? Okay, majority, the interesting majority. Uh, choose the language of choice in this case. I'm going to, the, the sign out of the door says Java, so I'll choose Java. Makes that easy. And then you choose the latest and greatest version of Spring Boot. I'm going to choose the latest and greatest stable one. And then you get to go shopping. Here you choose the type of workloads you'd like to support in your application. I'd like to build a web application. This is an 80% case kind of talk, so I'll use JPA, but again, if I were um, the sort of sort that made good life decisions, I'd make, make a more informed choice about the specific data access patterns I want to support and the technology I would use. I'm going to have a, a server generated view, so I'll use Timeleaf. Great. I want to export my Data access code through REST, so I'll choose that. Uh, for our demo, we use an embedded in memory database H2, so I'll choose H2, but again, choose whatever jar you like. This is all just going to be Maven after all. Um, I want to integrate with operations, so I'll choose these bits here. Uh, if we had another talk to give, it would be all about this column right here. This is all about, this is the future. We'll talk about that later, but that's the more interesting column. So here we go. Hit generate. Wait for my Wi Fi to. to do what it needs to do. Oh, I'm so good. So lucky. Uh, the relief. Right, so I, I have never given this demo before. Um, I'm going to take that here. Demo. Okay. Goodbye to that. Goodbye to this. Demo. Voila. Open this up in your IDE of choice. Uh, how many of you, by show of hands, are using Eclipse? Eclipse? Okay, what about Spring Tool Suite, which is the Eclipse distribution that we may, you know, release and maintain? What about IntelliJ? IntelliJ? Okay, cool. Uh, what about NetBeans? That one guy, is he here? <laughs> Hello, NetBeans guy? He follows me, you know. It's a little weird. Oh, oh that's so good. So, I'm going to give you a quick tour of the build artifacts here. We've got our normal uh, Maven build here. <clears throat> Some of the usual pro forma stuff you don't really care about. Don't need that. Don't need that. Uh, otherwise, this corresponds more or less to what we specified in the, in the wizard there at start.spring.io. So what you have here is Spring Boot Starter Actuators, Time Leaf, Web, Data Rest, J Data JPA. These are all more. These all just correspond to a checkbox, each one of them, and they are opinionated dependencies. How many of you have ever used, for example, the uh, Spring ORM module? Spring hyphen ORM. It's been in the framework since forever and a day. Anyway, okay. Well, uh, that is the jar that is shipped inside the Spring Framework to support data access with various ORM technologies, like JPA1 and JPA2, like Hibernate 3 and Hibernate 4 and Hibernate 4.1, and, you know, stop me if you've heard this one before, JDO. Anybody here remember JDO? JDO. Uh, I give away hugs, open source hugs. Here we go, if you need them. Uh, so that one module supports all those different data access technologies. It would be then insane if you were to bring in Spring hyphen ORM and it transitively brought in JPA1 and JPA2 and Hibernate 3 through, you know, through 4.1 or 4.2, whatever it is these days. Uh, so instead, we make all those different dependencies optional, which is great because it gives you the flexibility to use the right technology for your application. Maybe you've got an older application. We do a very good job of maintaining a backwards compatibility curve like none other. Uh, but for the, for the uh, inspired trying to get started today, it presents a burden. It presents extra configuration. So instead, the Spring Boot, we took a different tack. We said, let's provide an opinionated starter dependency that will, in turn, aggregate and bring in all, everything I need to be productive with JPA, for example. So this is going to bring in JPA 1.2. This is going to bring in Hibernate 3, you know, 4. whatever. It's going to bring in Spring's transaction support, JDC support, data source support, all that stuff out of the box. Okay? I don't need to muck around with all the versions either. That is because I'm using this parent dependency here. Now, uh, again, we have people on the uh, Spring team who have given up their hair for you. This is their burden. We have level set all these common ecosystem projects and all the Spring projects so that when you want to use Spring MVC and Spring Data and Spring Aggregation and Spring Batch and Spring whatever, uh, all the, if there's any common third party libraries, they're all level set. So you can just import them and use them, not worry about trying to make things line up and play whack a mole with different ranges of uh, versions. We do that not only for the Spring projects, but for common. Ecosystem projects like log, you know, log logging and uh, common CBCP and H2 and whatever, right? Uh, we don't 
import these dependencies directly, what we do. All right. Oh yeah, good stuff. What we do is uh, instead, we get, put them in a dependency management section, and then they're there for you. So you don't have to have them on your class path. Instead, to bring them on your class path, you bring in one of these uh, starters. Other than that, this is a fairly uh, boring main, Java main project. Here we go, public static void main. I've got a uh, static directory and a templates directory, both empty. I've got an empty application.properties file. And in my test directory, I have an empty unit test. So the code generation didn't really buy us much at all. You could have written this by hand where you so inclined. But I'm a lazy sort of guy, and we are on a timeline here, so I used the generator. So today we're going to build an application that has some sort of nonsensically trivial domain model. How many of you have heard of Open Table? Open Table. It's a way of making reservations at a restaurant. The idea is that you go to your phone, find the restaurant, see if they're open. If, you, if they're open, then you click on the wizard and click reserve, and you specify how many and then when. Uh, and that is apparently much faster than just calling them and say, I'll be there at five. Uh, so we're going to do something like that. We're going to say class, reservation, and then you say at entity. Okay, some, some don't, again, nonsensically trivial domain model. We don't want to have to focus too much on this. Okay, so reservation name. It's going to be a primary key. Great. And it's an ID. Now we're going to Java. Okay, so here we go. Here we go again. Some more. Okay. Um, what else do I need? Two string, that'd be nice, lovely, great. So now I have an entity with two fields and a lot of other stuff, which we're using another, perhaps more mature language or Lombok, uh, you wouldn't have to worry about. But we have what we need, so let's move on. I want to actually read and write this data, talking to my backend data store. So I'll use the idea of a repository. Now, when we talk about repositories, most of us think of the tedious boilerplate code that we've come to associate with uh, reading, writing, updating, deleting data. Uh, from a backend data store, like, for example, a SQL-based database. Uh, that's not the kind of code that you're going to go home and get excited about. Nobody's going to get promoted because you won't find by ID today. You know, nobody's going to be. There's no passing the back. There's no. There's none of that. You can't go home to your wife and say, "This I wrote a finder method for finding an entity by ID." It's, she's not going to care. You know. So why write it in the first place? This is something you can let the machine do. So. I'm going to say a reservation repository extends JP repository. And remember, uh, we chose Palm.xml, we chose Spring Boot Starter Data JP, but had we chosen Mongo or Elasticsearch or whatever, we could have used something else. Okay, so that's why we're using the JPA repository here. And I'm going to build a repository for, en for entities of type reservation whose primary key is of type long. And then this method, this interface is going to provide us you know, finder methods like find all, find all given sorting condition, a paging condition, etc. Uh, and even better, by convention, we can provide finder methods of our own. So reservation, find by reservation name, okay, string rn. And uh, that right behind the scenes will generate a query that looks something like select all from reservations where reservation underscore name equals rn. Okay? You can, of course, override this using the add query annotation if you like, uh, but that does bind you to the underlying language. If you're using Mongo, you'll get a, a BSON query. If you're using Cypher, you'll get a CQL query. If you're using um, Neo4j, you'll get a Cypher query. You'll get uh, the right thing for the right technology. Okay? Now, I want to actually use this repository. We're actually going to create some data. This is where the rubber meets the proverbial road. So I'll create a bean. Um, this is a Java configuration class. How many of you have used Java configuration? Okay. Java configuration is a way of describing Java objects using Shocker, Java. Now, you can use XML if you like, but it turns out that for all of its words, Java is actually really quite good at this. So what we've done is we've made it so that it's very, very simple to create these beam definitions uh, inside of a Java configuration class. This is the uh, actually a meta annotation. So it's a Java configuration class. And it turns out component scanning. So it'll find all the beans that are annotated with spring stereotype annotations in the current package or beneath it. And it turns on at enable auto configuration. That's the magic. So this annotation taken together is what turns on spring boot. I, just between you and me, I, you know, I'm not really a big fan of the name. Okay, I said it. I think they could have done better. I think something more like 
I want to go home early. It would have been more appropriate, but nobody listens to me. Fine. So, command line run. Okay, this is a bean. You can tell because it's the fancy of that bean. Uh, the type of the bean is command line runner. If I want to declare dependencies, I can declare them here in the arguments, and then Spring will inject them for me. And then the return value is what's going to actually be managed by the context. Right? So I'm going to def define a bean of type command line runner. A command line runner is an in interface that has one job. When Spring Boot starts up, it calls the run method, you know, Spring Boot calls the run method and passes in the public static void bean string argument ring. So this is a great place to launch a back office sort of uh, integration or batch processing kind of uh, logic, okay? Uh, here, I'm going to say return new command line runner. And again, it's a callback interface, so if you have another bean that implements this interface, any bean that has that interface will get called uh, appropriately. Uh, because it is an interface with just one abstract method, right, in terms of Java 8 parlance, right, one abstract method, uh, it's ideally suited for lambdas, right, which is a nice feature. So I can go ahead and drop all this noise, get rid of all this. And then, there we go. And of course, since this is being coerced ultimately into a, uh, an object of type command editor, I don't even need to specify the parameter prototype, because that's there. And as we've only got one parameter, I don't even need to specify the, uh, the parentheses. So my command editor looks more like this now. And now I can say, raise as list, okay, and then I'll say split, and I'll say for each name, uh, repository.save new reservation, in, and then I'll say uh, repository, oops, not that one, dot find my reservation name, and I'll look for Julie again, and I'll say for everyone that comes back, remember this is a list of reservation, so for everyone that comes back, I'll uh, enter reservation, that everyone that comes back, I'll call for each, and then I'll, uh, I'll say for every reservation R, print out the, uh, the object, and of course if you're uh, following Java 8, you know that this is sort of a waste, right? All I'm really doing here is I'm creating a lambda that then passes its argument to another function, or another method in this case. So much better to instead use method references, right? Which is another feature in Java 8. Goodbye to this, goodbye to that, much more concise. And indeed, I don't even need the intermediate variable, so I'll get rid of that, get rid of all this. And there we go, right? So I'm saying for every record that comes back that matches that, that predicate, print out the results. Similarly, I'll print out all the records that come back. You shouldn't do this in production, my friends. It's, it's bad, bad manners. Here we go. So I'm going to run this. This is going to talk to a database. Remember, we have H2 on the class path, which is an embedded in-memory database. Uh, and so by default, absent any specific configuration, it's going to create a data source for us that talks to H2. Uh, first of all, of course, we have our results. Of course, we got it. I mean, we knew that was going to happen. Do I look like I make mistakes? No, of course that's it. Much more importantly, however, look at this. Now, this is some very, very good ASCII work. We have on the Spring team two people who have PhDs who concern themselves with in prior lives with star stuff, the celestial bodies in the heavens. They are nuclear physics physicists. You know when you know that old that old thing where you're at a party and somebody says, "Oh, well, I'm a lawyer," and then somebody says, "Oh, well, you know, it's not rocket science." These guys can actually say that. It's really annoying. So. It makes me very happy, it tickles me to no end to imagine that at one point, one of them got a GitHub issue saying, darn it, we need good ASCII artwork. And look at that, they delivered. They delivered. Now, you can disable the ASCII artwork, you can change it, you can replace it with a better TXT, but I wouldn't do that. You couldn't do a better job, let's just be honest. Let's just put that out there right now. And it's very, very well done. I think you'll agree. So, uh, again, you can change it, but should you? There is a useless, completely, utterly useless feature inside of the IntelliJ Run dialog now that makes me sad. It's called Hide Banner. Why is that there? I didn't invite that there. That is not supposed to be there, but uh, but it is. So I'm not going to check that because I make good decisions in life. Good. So uh, we have our we have a little bit of data access logic. We're actually talking to the backend data store. They say that any application of sufficient complexity eventually sends email. Well, I posit that. In today's day and age, an application of sufficient complexity eventually sprouts a REST API. So, I'm going to bring back the web bits here, and I'll uh, 
build a little rest controller here, okay? So going down, class, reservation, rest controller. And I'm gonna do something that you should never ever do, not even when you're home by yourself and nobody's looking. I'm gonna use field injection. Again, you should prefer setters and constructors. Every time you do field injection, a unit test dies. Every time. So don't do it. So, at request mapping, like so, reservations, collection, like that. Okay, and it's just gonna be a controller that returns all the data in the database. Not all that practical, but hey, what are you gonna do? Here we go. Run. Okay, so we're off. Local host reservations. There's the data. I have a pretty printing plugin <laughs> um, that is, you know, prettily printing all the stuff in here. But uh, again, if you were to inspect the the output, you'd see it's just straight JSON. Nothing fancy about that. Um, I confess, I just did that to impress you. I just wanted you to see that it was very easy to build a REST API. Uh, but if I'm honest, this is actually uh, much more inefficient than the preferred way, which is to instead just let the repository do the work for you. So in order to do that, I'm going to bring back Spring Boot Starter Data REST. This is going to, uh, well, very naturally map our repository, which of course is concerned with the uh, state transitions of your business day from creating, reading, updating, and deleting. And it's going to map them to HTTP verbs. That's what REST is, after all, the mapping of HTTP verbs to the state transitions of, transitions of your business entities, creation, reading, updating, and deleting. So I'll say at REST repository, OK? And I'll go down here. I'm going to say at param, like that. Java 8 introduced a feature where at runtime, with reflection, for a class, I can discover the name of the variable. Uh, the name of the parameter for a method prototype. But for interfaces, that feature is still lacking, so you need to tell the runtime some other way that you want to name this parameter. That's what I'm doing here. I'm going to hit run. Here we go. And revisit, refresh. And you can see I've got basically the same thing as before. I've got the same results, I've got the same records. But for every resource that I've returned, I've got links from metadata about the resource. This is an implementation of the design pattern, Hot OS, right? Hypertext as the engine of application state. It's this idea that every REST response should have within that response information enough for any client to be able to further manipulate that response or that resource, right? So if you look at an HTML page and you have a link rel text CSS and it says source equals food.css, that is an example of metadata being returned to the client, in this case, the browser to be able to further process the response that it's looking at, the HTML, right? We see it all the time there. It's very natural that we would have the same thing for our business data. In order for a client, the browser, to navigate this collection of data, it can go to forward slash, and it can see that there's a few options here, for example, reservations. Good, we'll go to reservations. Now what? Well, I've got four records. I can go to reservations forward slash one, deep link, right? Just as I did before. Or, I can go to the search endpoint, right? So we saw that the, that finder method that I created is now available as well. So I can do search, find my reservation name. Question, R R N equals Julie, okay. And I get the record back. All that just sort of works, right? So it's very, it's a, you can support, you can send uh, posts and puts and leads and all that as well. This all just works out of the box. It's a great way to get what you want up and running very quickly. Now, that's, uh, a REST API we're talking to back in the data store. Uh, this wouldn't be much of a demo without actually some sort of MVC controller thingy. So let's do that. I'm going to say at controller class reservation MVC controller. Again, don't do this at home. Reservation repository at request mapping reservation. And I'm going to choose you know a straw man URL here just so that we can. You know, we understand that there's no correlation between the string that I'm going to type here and the method that gets invoked. And in order to, to make that point abundantly clear, I'm going to choose a URL that nobody would ever in their right mind, or even in, without their right mind, use in production on purpose. Something that is just so completely crazy that it defies belief. Let's see, reservations.php. So, there's our little page. Um, 
this model. This is a uh, spring VC ism. It's just a glorified hash map into which we can stuff uh, model value um, objects to be dereferenced from a view template we're going to render. That template, in this case, is going to be something reservations. And uh, that string will get plugged into something called a view resolver, which will then apply some sort of heuristic, in this case, prefixing it with source, mean, resources, templates, like that, and then suffixing it with .html. Okay. Uh, we want to add one attribute to our model, so I'm going to say reservations is going to be equal to all the reservations. All of them. Okay. We need a, a view, after all, so I'm going to go back to our build here and reinstate timeleaf. Now, timeleaf is a natural templating uh, uh, framework. It's a way of t doing uh, HTML markup and it can preview correctly in your browser or your designer tools. Have you ever had the experience where you, where you, where you hand off a, a JHP page to the designer and then he or she gives you the finger and then hands you a bag of flaming feces? You know what I'm talking about? That, has that ever happened to you? No? no. Well, it, it, it does. Have you ever wondered why they look at you like they hate you? I'm just saying, they, they really do hate you. They really do. So don't use JHP. It's not a good way to make friends. Uh, instead, we're going to use something else. You can use whatever you like. We're going to use Timeleaf, but if you want to use View uh, Velocity or FreeMarker or uh, Mustache or uh, I'm sure I'm forgetting what that doesn't work, but there's a lot of options. And, and, and indeed, there are um, starters here. So you can say Spring Boot Starter. Oh, Groovy Server Pages. You know, there's that one. Uh, FreeMarker. Yeah, you've got a lot of options, right? So choose what you like. Just, just don't choose JSP. I mean, there are literally things on the sidewalk that will do a better job of generating server-side generated HTML than JSP. Avoid, okay? Um, we need the template, so here we go, reservations.html. And I'm going to cheat, again, for want of time, cat desktop reservations, hello, pv copy, cat paste. So this is my I am not a designer uh, page. It's going to, for every reservation R in the reservations model attribute, which is what we're going to put in this controller here, it's going to print out this body of HTML, and then, you know, we'll dereference the reservation name and the ID, and we're off. So here we go. Run, run, run. Oh my. How are we doing for time? Okay, okay. Okay, so... Thank you for that. So we're going to go to reservations, forward slash, uh, reservations.php rather. And you can see we've got the data printed out. Not a big deal, but it doesn't work. And, you know, if I can do this, then you certainly can, right? So we have now a working REST API, right? We're able to de deep link. We're able to navigate without any prior knowledge, the REST topology. We're able to look at all the pretty information in the PHP page there. We're able to do all sorts of things. Talk to a back end data store, do finer logic, all that for very little code. Uh, and if this were the end of the story, then I would be happy because at least it's productive. But this isn't the end of the story. And the reason this isn't the end of the story is because if you've ever read Michael Nygaard's amazing classic tome, release it. By the way, how many of you have? Oh, recommended reading. Put that on the Oprah's Book Club. It's great. You've got to read this book. All of the, all of the books, save for the bits that have to do with uh, capacity planning, are perfect today. Like they're still great, even though it was written in 2007, uh, just as AWS was a thing, right? So definitely get that book. Read it to your kid. It's, it's that kind of book. It, he or she will, will be wiser for it eventually. Okay, it's a great book. Uh, the punchline in that book is that code complete is not the same as production ready, right? Though you may finish your application, you may feel like you're done. You're not actually done until you can go to production. And we all talk about agile. But how many of us actually do Agile? I mean, it's not really controversial to suggest that Agile is important. When was the last time we saw somebody really, really, really cantankerous and bullying about the idea that, no, waterfall's going to win, you know? Like, it doesn't happen, right? It's not a thing. But how many of us actually go to production after the first iteration? Right? That's the real question. And the reason we sometimes shrug that stuff off is because we want to get to the good code. We want to have fun. We want to build the interesting things. The bits like operations, integration, and security, and analytics, that can wait, right? And again, I understand, but if you're trying to move to this microservice architecture, if you're trying to move to the cloud, you need to be able to operationalize apps quickly, right? Agility, in this case, means faster time to market and all that. So a huge part of that is integrating with production systems. 
So to support these use cases, uh, we're going to revisit our Palm here, and I'm going to bring in the Spring Boot Starter Remote Shell and the Spring Boot Starter Actuator. Okay. I hear the um, the sadness. Okay. Brought those in. I'm going to restart my application. Take some water. those other wires. So uh, now if I revisit my app, I hit refresh, I'm willing on the refresh button as fast as my little fingers will let me. Here we go. Go to reservations, hit enter, refresh, 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 refresh. Go to four slash one, hit refresh, 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 refresh. Number two, sure, great, great, great. Oh, thank you, sir. Oh, yes. How do you build the water? Thank you. Good stuff. So there we go. All right, lots of a uh, Lots of requests being made. I can actually understand how many requests I've made by going to Fortouch metrics. This is a new endpoint that was registered by adding the actuator bits to the, to the, the class path. This shows me, for example, how, many memories I, how much memory I've got, how many processors I've got, the data sources, uh, how many requests I've made. So for example, uh, it says that I've made 10 requests for Fortouch reservations with status code 200. It says that I've made 12 requests for forward slash reservations, forward slash one or two or three with status code 200. I've made 20 requests to reservations at PHP, again with status code 200. If I go to trace, I can get an even deeper perspective on what's happening there. I can see all the requests that were made into the application and at which uh, contexts and the, the headers that were sent and received. If I go to beans, I can get a view of all the different beans that have been wired up for me on behalf of, or you know, for us by spring. Uh, and their dependencies. So for example, I can see that my reservations MVC controller is a class whose class file lives at this location that has one dependency reservation repository, et cetera. So if you were to take all this JSON data and then dump it into Neo4j, you'd get a very interesting um, topology graph. If you go to ENV, you'll see the system properties as well as the uh, system environment, you know, the, the shells and all that stuff. If you go to uh, dump, you'll get a stack trace. If you go to, what else do I have? Oh, mappings, one of, a, one of the, my favorites. This will show you all the Spring MVC endpoints that have been exported for you uh, by Spring MVC and by your code. And it'll show you the controllers that are handling it and the required uh, HTTP verbs to be able to access those requests, those, those paths. So for, so for example, the mappings endpoint only supports HTTP GET. It doesn't support POST, for example. Uh, all of this stuff is just one view on the same kind of information that is available otherwise, right? So you can actually get at it from JConsole, for example, or JMX in general. Uh, anybody here use JMX? Anybody? Okay, it's a thing. It's operations people love it. So mbeans, here you go, endpoint. And then I can say, well, show me my health, my health endpoint. I forgot to mention there's a health endpoint here. So voila. There you go. So it's showing me a limited subset of the health information here. The rest of it is considered sensitive. You can unmask it, of course, but by default, it's not available th from the REST endpoint. However, you can see it inside of JMX. So you can see that we have so much disk space. We have a database with a connection pool whose validation query returns one, hence hello equals one. Uh, we have you know, this basic information here. If we were to use Redis or Solar or RabbitMQ or MongoDB, we would have appropriate health checks there as well, and you can, of course, override all of this, right? Uh, this is one way to get at, at, get at the data. My absolute favorite way to see all this information is to use the remote shell, which we added as well. This is based on Crash D, the, uh, the shell, the open source project, uh, and you can write custom plugins and so on. It requires authentication. If you're using Spring Security, which is dead simple to set up, it'll talk to any identity provider that Spring Security can talk to, including Active Directory, PAM, Kerberos, OAuth, OpenID, whatever, right, LDAP. Uh, but absent that, it'll give us a default user and a default password. In this case, our password is whatever this is here. Here we go, SSH minus P 2000 user at 127.0.0.1. Hello, hello, paste. Good. Good ASCII artwork. This is very comforting when you're in a production crisis trying to triage something. It's very, very calming, I think you'll find. Help. Ask for help. Good. You can do things like analyze the properties. You can say, OK, well, what about the endpoints? Well, great. Endpoint list. Endpoint invoke health endpoint. 
endpoint. Okay, there's that information there. The metrics are there as well, except I'm, my hands are off and it's still refreshing the numbers live. So this is actually a live view of the memory of the, of the application. Uh, my absolute favorite view is dashboard. <laughs> this is Java top at the very top there. Live as well, right? And then on the bottom right, you have the memory. And uh, again, if you're using Java 1.8, Metaspace is the new perm gen. Otherwise, in 1.6 or 1.7, you'll get perm gen. So again, all of this is just different ways to look at the same information. If you have the drop wizard metrics library in the class path, uh, then you can configure a reporter. And then anything that drop wizard metrics can talk to, like, for example, graphite for uh, visualizations of date requests over time, you can talk to from this actuator framework, which is what's under, underpinning all of this, right? So we have a few different exposures for all of these different uh, metrics and gauges and so on, but you can extend them by using the drop wizard metrics library. Now, it's worth noting that you can customize all of this, right? So, uh, so far, I have used the defaults, and I, I've added more, um, as I've added more code, I've gotten more features. Uh, as I added more types, I got more features. But I can override things. Again, this is Spring. Spring is about dependency injection at the end of the day. And dependency injection is a great way to plug in your implementation where appropriate, right? So let's define a bean of type health indicator to override the default health indicator that we get. And I'll call it go to health indicator, okay? And a health indicator has one job. It is to return a health object when asked. Uh, you can inject this anywhere you want to, to manipulate the state. Uh, in your component code, for example, if something goes wrong, you call health. Okay, 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 okay. Uh, you can call health indicator and set the state or whatever. Uh, but I'm going to just do something simple like health dot status, nope, health dot status. And instead of being out of service or up or down or whatever, I'll say status, I heart Chicago dot build, voila. And of course, this is a natural candidate for lambda, so Goodbye to all this, goodbye to all that, goodbye to all this. Okay, much better. Uh, and I, want also to, I also want to change uh, how this application is running. I had all those rest endpoints exported on the root, the same root as the rest of my application. I can change that through the judicious use of properties, right? Environment variables, dash d arguments, properties. This could be an application of properties file or an application dot yaml. Uh, it can be in the jar or external to the jar. Either way, the effect is the same. Uh, so I'm going to say server, look at that, that's cool, right? Auto-completion for all the properties that's in IntelliJ now. It's in NetBeans, it's in STS. Server.port equals 8080, or no, 8000. I'll say that management, the management endpoints, the metrics and all that, that's going to be prefixed with forward slash admin, so I can secure it if I want. I can say management.port equals 9000, right? And then I'm going to rerun the application. And what this is going to do is going to tailor both the beans that I've got in play as well as the way that the existing beans uh, are, are wired up as well, you know, how they're configured. So if I go here, this won't work naturally. So 8080, gone, but 8,000 forward slash reservations, that'll work. Uh, Localhost 9,000 forward slash admin forward slash beans, that works as well, right? So again, I can change these things very naturally. If I go to my J console endpoint here, Open this up, connect, insecure connections, mbeans, go, go, go. Ba, ba, ba. Health endpoint, operations, get data. And you can see that go to status out of Chicago gets plugged in as well, right? So I'm able to override and modify every part of the stack uh, as, as I please, right? This is a, a very natural way to build applications. Uh, we're using a jar here. Remember what we talked about, right? Make jar, not war. Very important. Uh, jars are particularly easy to operationalize and deploy. So if you look at my code here, Maven clean install. Oh, can you guys hear that? Oh, that was awesome. Oh, I feel better. Hope you enjoyed that as much as I did. So CD target, Java minus jar. Demo. This is the jar, right? I can run this whole thing uh, just using that. <sighs> Not to be ageist, but I could even send this to grandpa, and he could run it, right? Like, if you have the ability to run applets, you can run Java minus jar. That's, that's the point. So um, it's a fairly big jar, because I'm using uh, all of Hibernate, 
right? So 39 megs, that includes everything I need to run this application. Uh, if I want to overwrite, I can run it like this. I can just say Java minus jar demo, blah, blah, blah. It'll start up and complete with pretty printed uh, color codes and all that stuff. Um, but I can override things as well. Remember, this is very important. You can move this to different environments. So if I wanted to, for example, say export server underscore port equals you know, 8010, I could do that. Or I could do Java minus jar uh, demo and then do dash D server dot port, et cetera, 8020, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. So you can override the defaults very, very naturally by uh, these properties. The benefit of this is that you can take these kinds of jars, move them to production very easily. Again, I think a lot of us use things like Tomcat because it's the consistent image we know, right? We know how to operationalize it. You can, no matter what you're building, throw it inside of a Tomcat and, de and deploy. How are we doing? Oh, good. That's okay. This is using embedded Tomcat, by the way, but you can use embedded Jetty or Undertow, which is the Wildfly. It's the embedded web server from the application server formerly known as JBoss. Right, I got that right, it's a long name. It's like the, they need a symbol now, you know, just that. So um, you can do whatever you like, we don't care. Uh, again, Pivotal is, is the, we have the lead developers in Tomcat, right? So I gain nothing by steering you away from using or deploying Tomcat. But the point is, if you're trying to build an application and you're, you know, you have things that you need to configure in the container. I see a lot of different people using Tomcat configuration and they check it into their source code. That smells to me. That seems like your, your application configuration and the application server configuration are part and parcel of the same thing. And if you're doing that, then really shouldn't they be the same thing, right? That's, I, I don't see anybody deploying multiple applications to a single application server. Instead, it's one application per Tomcat. And they configure it, checking it, check it in, manage it, and then run it. And they're, they belong to each other, and you can't separate the two, right? So why should they be different? Okay. Um, imagine if the prevailing protocol to, du jour today was, was FTP instead of HTTP. What if we were all building FTP-based services for some sick reason? Would we be so happy deploying our working Java code into an FTP server every day? Would you go home and tell your kids that you deployed things into an FTP server? Would you be happy with that? Probably not, right? It's, it's, it's sick, right? There's something wrong with us. We have this thing where we deploy code into an HTTP server, but that's not really important. If you need HTTP, great. Use HTTP, treat it like a library. It's just one more way to expose your data. If you don't, great, right? So uh, that extra bit of indirection doesn't help you at all. It certainly doesn't make operations, operation lives easier. If you're working in a cloud platform, processes rule. They are queen, right? Uh, they're not. It, they don't, your, your clouds don't think about Tomcats and web spheres and web logics. They think about processes. They kill them, start them, stop them, scale them, et cetera. The, the more you can do to make it so that that process is as light as possible, the better, right? So again, Java jar for the win. Now, uh, last bit before we get into questions. Uh, all of this is happening thanks to the magic of something called uh, auto configuration. That's that Spring Boot application jar we looked at, or the annotation we looked at earlier. Every, every jar, in Spring Boot that has something meaningful in terms of code, contributes a spring.factories text file. You can do the same thing in your jars. So spring.factories, org spring framework boot auto configure enable auto configuration equals, and then you see a comment of the limited list of Java configuration classes. These handle all manner of things, JDBC, JTA, you know, uh, liquid based, um, mail, mobile, MongoDB access, hypermedia integration, Jackson, JPA, you know, whatever. Everything that we've looked at and then a lot more is all accounted for in a few of these jars. And uh, these Java configuration classes are, you'll be happy to know, not all loaded at runtime because they would need, by definition, all the types required to support them. We design these configuration classes like this. We put it, it's just a regular Java configuration class. And then we add Spring Boot's conditional on class annotations and we say, if the type for rabbit template is on the class path, which in this case, it's clearly not, great, then load the bean definitions that are in Inside this configuration class. If not, abort. Don't bother, right? So again, we don't get, we don't pay for the cost of having to configure RabbitMQ if we don't have the types for RabbitMQ in the class path. Similarly, we can say here for this bean definition, we say define the bean called AMQP admin, but do so only if there's no property called spring.rabbitmq.dynamic that is specified to false, and do so only if the user in this case has a, not defined a bean of type AMQP admin, right? So we can provide useful defaults, but back off in the case of something to override it, 
right? So this happens all over the framework. And you can do the same thing. Create a jar, define an auto configuration for something that's interesting for your organization, maybe security, which is something that teams have to get correct across all their projects. You know, integrate with the same backend LDAP stack or whatever, or log logging or auditing or Sarbanes-Oxley compliance, whatever. Put it in an auto configuration, add a little spring.factories text file in the meta directory, and then all your Spring Boot-based projects will pick it up automatically. And the developer with, on a specific module can override the pieces there dynamically, just as we've done here. So you saw, as I added Spring Boot Starter Actuator, I got actuator endpoints. As I added Spring Boot Starter Web, I got uh, Tomcat managed as a bean instead of Spring. And it ran my application for me, right? This is all based on this dynamic model that you see here. So you can use the same mechanism. There are a lot of companies that are using Spring Boot uh, very heavily. Um, Anybody here hear of Netflix? Netflix? Okay, they're using it. Uh, not all of them, but a lot of them. Uh, Ticketmaster? Ticketmaster, they sell tickets, you know. 40-year-old business. They have a $50 million an hour business all going through Spring Boot-based services. Their entire organization is now based on Spring Boot. So again, a lot of different you know, use cases for this stuff. The goal here is to make it as simple as possible to build up services and stand them up and get them into production. What you really care about eventually is getting a lot of different services, right? That's the sort of natural next step. That's what we talk about when we talk about microservices. A lot of different services working together that makes it easy to scale out. Spring Boot, I would say, is a very, very simple way to get something up and running. But when it comes to managing the complexity in inherent in having lots of these services running around in production, then you need more, right? And for that, I hope you'll consider something called Spring Cloud, which is a set of it's a codification of all these common design patterns for distributed systems, including uh, integration of a lot of the great Netflix OSS stack uh, and things like uh, Zookeeper and Console and so on. Um, what else? Anything else to mention? I guess that's it. So with that, I'll take questions. Uh, I wanted to say thank you guys for having me. I hope this was worth your time. What would you think? Yes? No? Boot? Maybe? Okay. <laughs>